Blog Talk Radio. Hello, everyone. I'd like to welcome all of you back to Ohio Exopolitics. I'm your host, Mark Snyder, and we are back, of course, studying the Billy Meyer case. And uh, <clears throat> just dropped in here at the end of my day and felt an impulse, an impulse to look at some of the Meyer material. And particularly, I thought I would get back to a little bit of information in The Way to Live that talks about fulfilling your duty to yourself. And this is a concept that Billy talks about in his book in the German called Die Art zu Leben. In the English, it's called The Way to Live. It can be found on pages 26, 20, 30, 32, through 36, it says, if a human want, being wants to live truly and fairly, then he has to consider and understand that the fulfillment of the duty to self is constantly and always the most important and foremost. Now, what does that mean? What does it mean to fulfill your duty to yourself? He talks about uh, grooming, just like when you're alone at home, no one can see you. Still, groom yourself, clean yourself up. Um, exercise is probably a good way to do that. Uh, anything, I think, associated with with taking care of yourself, your life power, your Lebenskraft. It says, don't turn your back on yourself and be benevolent, which means to be kind-hearted, good-natured, philanthropic. It says, no self-chastisement, no self-abuse, no feelings of inferiority, no bitterness. Be gentle to yourself. Do not flatter yourself either. Care for the health of your body. I mentioned exercise. Also, it's very important to care for the health of your mind. So let's talk about caring for the health of your mind a little bit. There are certain habits that I've developed that I think follow pretty much what what Billy is talking about. And uh, I got these habits mostly from studying Billy's other book called The Might of Thoughts, particularly in like the second half of the book. And and I've learned that there are certain things, and he talks about memorizing some things. And which So I memorized some things from the book here. And really good to use in the morning when you wake up. And I know a lot of us wake up and we're not in the best of moods and we're not necessarily enthusiastic to get going in the day. But I tell myself I'm confident, I'm optimistic, I'm relaxed, I'm cheerful, I'm enthusiastic. I'm the master of my own destiny, the forger of my own fortune, the creator of my own good luck. I do not allow my thoughts to drift. I steer my thoughts like a captain steers his ship. I strengthen my thoughts. I nurture my thoughts. I clarify my thoughts. I organize my thoughts. It's the nature of the thoughts that by their might alone, every conceivable thing can be brought into fruition. And the universal creation law says that thoughts enlivened by might and power will have an effect. And that effect is directly related to the might and the power of the thoughts. So we've got to really nurture our our thoughts, to strengthen our thoughts, to, to clarify your thoughts, and then your consciousness will be like a garden filled with healthy, flourishing plants. And... There will be times when tangled ideas confuse your thoughts and it causes them to go abruptly from one extreme to another, which causes a misdirection of the thoughts and triggers emotions, which can lead to murder and manslaughter. And as a rule, suffering is an effect of some form of wrong thinking. And incidents of suffering in the life are indicators that the law of harmony has been broken and disregarded. Every human 
should nurture his daily cheerful enthusiasm. And a human should never think in terms of being needy because thoughts like words live and you'll create the circumstances of neediness in your life. Anyway, those are just a few ideas for you to use every day for correcting your thoughts, for caring for the health of your of your psyche. Uh, another thing Billy says is don't devote yourself to your passions, to your lust, to your vices, to your addictions. He says use your intelligence, your rational logic. Or you will have no enjoyment in the fulfillment of your responsibility. Page 30 says, You must not oppress yourself through self-chastisement or self-abuse. A lot of us do that. We, If we fail, then we just make it worse by, by telling ourselves how horrible we are. And we just abuse ourselves. And no, if you fail, you just get up and get right back to striving. Um, people abuse themselves or they, they have self-disregard or, or bitterness or feelings of inferiority and so forth. This is depravity, and we should never fall into this. We must never self-neglect ourselves. Uh, and also, we should never flatter ourselves either. We're looking for neutral positive all the time in our thinking through the real overcoming all of these negative things that I've talked about, you'll start to master your life and your intended, your attentiveness will be steered away from your burdens. And let me explain something because when we have negative thoughts or we have any kind of thoughts, a lot of times our feelings will come out of our thoughts. And many times if we're focused on negative thoughts, we'll have negative feelings. We may not even be conscious of what we're thinking about. And these negative feelings start to crop up and take over as feelings of dread, feelings of hope, hopeful, hopelessness, feelings of grief. Now, if you practice what I just told you about, try to take part of the Meyer material and memorize it and just feed it back to yourself. You know, I used to, and I still do, uh, I've memorized a lot of the passages on love. And one of my favorites is, love is the highest principle in all creation. And through it, everything exists in absolute logic. And I've held on to that for years now. Uh, because the creation the universal consciousness is very logical. And that's good. Because that means that things are rational and make sense. It's only the human beings that are irrational. So you can steer yourself away from burdens and attach your mind to something that's neutral. Attach it to these words or have a wish dream. Uh, think back about a beautiful sunny day when you were in a beautiful environment with, with good people or good animals or good plants or all of the above. Think about your cat or your dog or, or your wife or some accomplishment you accomplished. You did. Um, you need to, we all need to give ourselves sufficient respect. And others will respect us when we respect ourselves. And Billy talks about the I, you know, yourself, your sublime I. Um, and maybe we can talk about that more a little bit later. That's something I could probably do a little more studying on. But one of the things he says is never allow yourself to appear ragged in your clothing, in your self-care, not even when you are hidden and forgotten by the world. And I, this morning when I was getting ready uh, for work, I, you know, we're having trouble with our hot water heater. So I, I was creative. I, I uh, used our coffee maker. To, to not make coffee, but to make hot water. And it kind of helped while I was going quickly through my, my, my things to get ready today. So the idea here is to care for your health, for your body, for your psyche, for your consciousness. 
And not just like you take care of your body with exercise and you take care of your body with food. You should take care of your consciousness. And that's part of your fulfilling of your duty to yourself. We shouldn't devote ourselves to our passions, to our lusts, to our addictions. If you do, you'll feel like someone that is running through the smoldering desert, dying of thirst. If a human being does not continually pay attention to himself and does not fulfill his duties to himself, then he or she declines and ends in misery, whereby even suicidal thoughts are not infrequent. So you can go straight to the bottom with just not fulfilling your duty to yourself. And again, others won't respect you if you don't respect yourself. And don't do hidden things that you would feel ashamed of if strangers saw you. So consider yourself as wise and as skillful as anybody. Now, this is something we don't do in our society. We have what are called quote-unquote experts. And I hate that. Oh, boy. Do not depend on the experts. Do your own thinking. Do your own independent thinking and draw your own conclusions even if you disagree with the experts because that's just another form of being submissive. You know, you you are intelligent enough to think for yourself and, and speak the truth freely. Don't lose confidence in yourself. Um, So if you speak freely, if you, if you, fulfill your duty to yourself, then love, the love that you have for people, for places and for animals and plants, will clothe you. But if you're not thinking in terms of neutral positive, if you've lost the law of harmony, then love will make you feel completely naked. And we're not talking about having clothes on or not having clothes on. We're talking about being completely exposed in terms of your feelings, your intentions, and your thoughts. The naked truth. You can have the naked truth. You can have naked aggression. You can you can be uh, inappropriate. Uh, you become bare. Um, naked suggests the absence of protective or ornamental clothing, destitute, defenseless. This is what it is when your thinking is wrong because love, when your thinking is wrong, you will not have true love. You will have affective love, which is romantic love. Contact Report 10 talks about love. For example, in Contact Report 10, it says the earth human speaks of a love that he does not know. He believes he knows that his sentiments are love, and through this he deceives himself. Love cannot be clothed in words, because it is, just as happiness is, a state and not a place. True love is imperishable, and nothing is able to change it into something else. So the effective love, the true love, The love of creation is rock hard and stable. Now, there's a wrong form of love, and it's artificially created. And try to avoid that in your dealings with people, animals, plants, because you will find yourself behaving in inappropriate ways. So speak the truth freely, openly, and unvarnished. Even if the people you're speaking to may not be able to hear it, even if they object to it. This is something I'm working on myself, as well as not being submissive. Always act, think, feel, and speak in good form. And be decent, because if you don't, you'll forfeit your self-esteem. That means always think about how you're presenting yourself to other people. Your clothes speak for you, because... You always form your exterior according to your innermost. 
So never allow yourself to appear ragged in your clothing, in your self-care, even when you're hidden, as I was talking about at the beginning of the show. Even if you're forgotten by the world, even if you're all alone somewhere in the deepest desert, still groom yourself. Still dress well. Never lose confidence in yourself. And always consider that you may always be just as wise and skillful as anyone else. Um, Let's talk a little bit about humanity here. There are no two human beings in in the whole universe that are at the same level of evolution. So you'll always be lower or higher than someone else. And even in different areas, you know, you can be higher in one area, they can be higher in another. So another aspect of fulfilling your duty to yourself is to not be controlled by any desires. You you should not be controlled by the desire to be the person in the shining lead role, so to speak. Um, uh, Boredom is another one. Uh, Boredom is the death of all initiative. Um, If you fall prey to boredom, then you can fall prey to addictions and vices. Every human being must always be a good and pleasant companion for himself. That's one of the keys, general ideas of fulfilling your duty to yourself, is be your own friend. Don't hurt yourself. You know, don't think thoughts that hurt your your own self. Um, Only very few human beings are able to understand how boredom, poverty of thought, and self-centeredness lead to a deteriorating or to a monotonous, uninteresting inner nature. So almost everything that you can possibly think of is connected with this fulfillment of your duty to yourself. So, and I I look at fulfilling my duty to myself as part of the law of harmony. If you wanted to put this into the creation of natural laws, to me this this is fulfilling my duty to myself keeps me harmonious. That's part of the law of harmony, I would say. Um, But it's again, related to the other creational natural laws as well. One of the, I call the second creational natural law, striving. And to strive means to make great efforts to achieve or attain something. It means to struggle or fight vigorously. To strive means to devote serious effort or energy. I personally think striving can be enjoyable. Like, I think, this show is part of my striving, and I think it can be very enjoyable if it's approached with the correct mental attitude. Music example it could be part of your striving. Your striving does not have to be something that's drudgery. I even, uh, from time to time, enjoy cleaning out, cleaning up all the mess my cats leave. Uh, it's just part of being getting organized. And uh, the German word streben pronounced streben means to strive and uh, even in the goblet of truth there's something that talks about striving it says the principles of the primal power are laid to care for the obligation of the knowledge to be striven for and the wisdom of the truth and for you not to bow down to any of your kind human beings nor to any divinity there's do not be submissive there's that concept again there's also a, t- um, a paragraph in, in, in the Goblet of the Truth that says, um, rivers, stones, plants, animals, bushes, trees, everything that crawls and flies on the earth is a life form with a spirit form. And these spirit forms are on a journey through time, which involve many, many lifetimes. And death is just the passage into the world of pure spirit. And many of these creatures are connected by psychic vibrations, which are sometimes called swinging waves. And our thoughts give out these swinging waves. 
And you can see how the birds, they, they function in flocks. And you can see the swinging wave. I call it the swinging wave that's interacting between those birds. They're aware of each other in almost like a internal radar. It's amazing. So we have something similar in our consciousness that produces this this wave. That, and it's an electromagnetic wave that can ha have great power or force at times. And, uh, later, as we evolve through many, many uh, lifetimes, we'll become more and more powerful. Just a quick review of uh, some important things in the psyche to keep my my thinking right. We we have a material consciousness that has a life and death. Your material consciousness lives and dies. Okay. Your spiritual consciousness never dies. It always lives. Ever since its beginning, it's done nothing but live. And the spirit form comes into the body of the child at 21 days. Heart starts to beat. Energy goes throughout the whole body in the lattice structure. Now, something called your psyche controls the thoughts and the feelings of your material consciousness. Now, when you were a child first born, your conscious mind was pretty much a clean slate. Now, your subconscious had been programmed with all the evolutive values of your previous lives. Evolutive values include your sense of love, your sense of um, duty, like fulfilling your duty to yourself. Your evolutive values deal with your confidence, your optimism, with how relaxed you can be, your ability to analyze things, your sense of loyalty, uh, your knowledge of love. All of these things that you learned from your previous lives are stored in your spirit form, for one thing. They're also stored in your subconscious. So that's the material consciousness, your conscious mind, your personality, your subconscious, your unconscious. Now your spiritual consciousness deals with something called your spirit form. And the spirit form resides in the physical body. But within the spirit form, there's something called the gemut, which controls the thoughts and the feelings of the spiritual consciousness. Your, your consciousness, your spiritual consciousness, is not completely aware. It's kind of focused on recording everything that you do, everything you think. It's it's functioning when you're sleeping. It's functioning. It never dies. It records everything that you do, and it analyzes your thoughts. It, it tells you if your thinking or, is right or wrong, if you've learned to pay attention to it. And those are those little signals that we get from the spiritual consciousness. And you'll think a thought, and then you have a negative feeling, and I think... That comes after the spirit form informs us through a signal that your thought maybe wasn't neutral positive. Now, this is part of introspection, which is real critical. Um, and one of these signals that we get that comes from the spiritual consciousness is the, the signal, the impulse to strive. And on page 100 of The Way to Live, it says, As is the case with creation itself, every single vision of any kind, from the very first breath to the very last, also strives for that which is higher for evolution and completion. And what is a vision? It's individuality based on the core of one's inner nature. So the creation itself, as well as all its creatures, and Vaisen Heighten is imbued with the power of striving in order to attain success, progress, and that which is higher. Now, what is a Vaisen Heighten? A Vaisen Heighten is a German word for an immaterial or material form of existence without a self-determining possibility of evolution, whereby, however, this can 
be given to a certain extent, for example, to the creational universal consciousness, but a vase and heighten could be certain energies, certain stones, certain kinds of, you know, water, gases, etc. So another important thing to understand is your inner natural form. So your entire body and, and your, the brain of a human being, as well as the spirit, are two fundamentally different inner natural forms, both of which, in their core substantial, as well as their high, fine food of kind, they're fundamentally different natures. <laughs> so you have a spiritual consciousness. You have a material consciousness. And striving is the power of the physical as well as the spiritual. So here's a very interesting little passage from the Goblet of Truth. It says, Truly, in everything lies simple creational laws and recommendations, and the fine fluidal, and in the high fine fluidal spiritual as well as in the most coarse material. And indeed, these laws and recommendations cannot be changed or bent. The first Creational natural law is love. It's effective love. It's stable love. It's a love between uh, a father and son, a mother and a daughter, between brothers. It's effective. It is very stable. It's based on neutral positive thinking. It stays within the law of harmony. Affective love is very unstable. The second creational natural law is striving which we've talked about a little bit. Third creational natural law is the law of harmony, which means you have to think in a um, uh, neutral, positive fashion. Okay. So let me get back into this whole idea of fine fluidal energy. And I want to, again, read something from the Goblet of Truth. It says, Even in each single happening and in all motions, in all expansions of the universe, as well as in all levels of the substantial, semi-substantial, the fine fluidal and high fine fluidal, and the pure spiritual, the creational laws and re recommendations act in an, un an absolutely unchangeable way, so therefore also in the most tender development of your thoughts and feelings, which must be assigned to the semi-substantialness. So these creational natural laws, they function in the spirit realm, they function in the physical, they function in your thoughts, they function in your feelings. And one of these incontrovertible creational laws is striving. And we strive to reach through in incessant evolution that which is higher and more fully developed. So I want to talk a little bit about striving, materialism, and religion, and the way that religion sometimes screws up our sense of striving, because we're supposed to depend on the experts, okay, or we're supposed to be submissive like sheep, when we really need to think, and to think in neutral, positive ways. This is interesting. Um, bear with me just a second here. Um, <coughs> excuse me. We just fly a little bit by the seat of our pants sometimes. I thought, okay. <laughs> I put the wrong book when I was looking at these notes. Yeah, I didn't see what I thought I was going to see. Okay. Okay. We're going to talk, we're going to read a little bit about religion and about this whole idea of God. There's a universal consciousness, which is not a Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father, or any kind of father, has to violate your free will, has to stop the child from burning the house down, has to stop the child from running out into traffic, has to violate the free will. The universal consciousness does not do that. And the con the idea of God 
also bears the responsibility. So let me start there, and then we'll continue. God simply bears the responsibility for everything and anything. But with this religious, sectarian, imbecilic, irrational teaching, it does not occur to any believer that the impertinent assertion and lie is immediately followed by the contradiction. When it is further asserted via rational teaching that an error which a human being makes, each mistake and every wrong word and so forth is a sin, which according to the divine order must be atoned for through punishment and indulgences or through the eternal purgatory and so forth. According to this irrational teaching, through God's decree, anything which does not suit him is punishable. But on the other hand, according to the religious, sectarian, irrational teaching, the human being is not supposed to have his or her own free will. Rather, has to rely on doing exactly all that which God orders and which he has in his wisdom and farsightedness as well as in his predetermination already predetermined from that it follows that if the human being has no free will and cannot determine and conceive of anything in his or her life himself or herself how can she then do anything other than just exactly that which God has predetermined the result of this religious sectarian assertion of the irrational teaching is this God has therefore predetermined every single error and every single infamous action or every single evil or mendacious word or every single human being whereby no human being is able to do anything other than follow and pay tribute according to the divine predetermination for which however he or she is again punished through God's might through this religious sectarian irrational teaching every believer's creational natural innate striving for that which is higher and for the highest possible absolutely full development is throttled and even eliminated. But if the human being lacks striving, then he or she no longer finds and recognizes any zeal or life determination toward which would be rewarding to work and to live. He or she becomes dependent on religious, sectarian, wrong philosophy, or rational teaching and dogmas. And every normal, rational human being recognizes this as absurd. To be a believer means to be without striving, to no longer have any initiative in regard to the natural advancement, to no longer be integrated into any evolution. To be without striving means to stagnate and to wither. Dogmas destroy the striving of the human being. He or she becomes powerless and incapable of living. He or she is no longer able to make his or her way alone and independently and loses his or her individuality. He or she withers into dogma de- directed like a herd animal, which for better or for worse is in bondage to the master. Or he or she withers into the non-viable outcast outsider whose life consists of murderous or criminal deeds of uncontrolled pathological cravings, vices, irrationality, and delusional assumptions. Human beings who do not understand and do not fulfill their own striving for that which is higher are chronic sufferers. 
quite regardless of whether they have reached their grief via fake philosophies or religious sectarianism. When the human being being's own striving lies fallow, then he or she is no longer to able to reach for that which is new, to investigate the new, and to set him or herself a zeal, a life determination, a target. He or she no longer has any purpose in life, or he or she wanders around as a wrong philosophical religious sectarian herd animal who believes to be able to see a sense of life in irrational teachings which are directed by dogmas which completely rob the human being of his or her own initiative and responsibility. Without exception, dogmas make divinities the primary matter which at the same time are justified and defended by the dogmas themselves. However, this only happens because the erstwhile inventors of the dogma were themselves led to the unreal and found no truthly sense in the life which solely lies in the striving. Regard, regulated according to the fundamental creational laws and perpetual evolution for each creature, each existence, all creation, and all life, as well as for the creation itself, right up to the 10 to the 49th power, different forms of creations in an unending number, up to the absolute absolutum. Now, that was some very deep and very profound stuff. I'm personally going to have to go back and study it and try to absorb it in a little more deeper way. Uh, thanks for bearing with me. I hope you enjoyed this. It certainly has been a benefit to me. You've been listening to Ohio Exopolitics. I'm your host, Mark Snyder. Have a great evening.